Welcome back to Outcast Beautiful Oho people. It's so good to have you back or here for the first time for episode five of our live stream about all things made with love by passionate people in regional Victoria. Look, of course, if you missed the uh, first few episodes where we talked honey, hot sauce, energy bars and cheese, those episodes are available in, uh, in our Instagram TV for you to watch back at any time. Make sure that you uh, follow us on our Insta page to get the notifications when we do go live with Outcast. And by the way, thanks to everybody who has watched so far and a huge thanks to everyone who's gone on from there to purchase goods from OHO Markets on our website or from the producers directly. We really encourage you to support our amazing Victorian regional producers by buying from the curated selections at OHO Markets or through the Click for Vic campaign or any of the collections that various councils and local bodies have put together. Of course, you can buy directly from the producers as well. And speaking of those producers, today on the show, I'm talking to Marcus Satchel from Dirty Three Wines in South Gippsland. A quick primer, though, I have to let you know that I've known Marcus and Lisa since we bought the empty block of land next to their house in the Yarra Valley in about 2000-ish. Marcus was first, of, first over the fence with a power extension cord for our building efforts, a move he may have regretted because... Look, once we started making a hell of a building racket, Marcus and Lisa seemed to move to South Gippsland fairly quickly. A move I like to think that was more about the opportunity to return to that area rather than the construction noise, but I'll ask Marcus about that in a minute. So Marcus has had a long career as a winemaker and a checkered past as a musician. Today we're going to talk all things wine, dirt, Gippsland and music. And at least we'll, we'll start that way. And to be honest, having seen Marcus on the Peyton and Jones show a couple of months ago, I have no idea where this is going to go. So g'day Marcus. <laughs> Oh, mate, G'day, it's good mate. to see you guys again, and and to um, you know I've followed vicariously and by drinking um, the the progress of Dirty Three over the years. Uh, it's it's really good to have you um, on here as part of One Hour Out and talking all things Git Fund. Thanks for having me, mate. It's great to be here. I, I want to start, Marcus, just by showing people a little clip um, that we've got stored here. Um, I'm seeing people, you're not seeing this, Marcus isn't seeing this everyone, but there he is in a green coat with a floppy hat and a saxophone on a beach. Uh, fairly iconic piece of uh, Australian culture in and of itself. It was actually in a salt lake out in near Werribee. Oh really? <laughs> yeah right, so that is of course um, cranky Australia don't become America. Um, from what year was that Marcus? 94, 93, 94, yeah, something like How that. How did a boy from Gippsland end up you know, on the Melbourne music scene playing, well, in what turned out to be one of the great hits of that summer, didn't it, um, for, for Triple J listeners? Yeah, um, how did I end up there? I guess it's a really funny turn of events, like that whole thing is I grew up down here where I am and where I'm currently in Inblock. Um, we're now cellar door and um, I grew up in Montagu, which is just down the road. Yeah. Um, and like, the funny thing is, is I just couldn't wait to get out of here. So um, as, a, as a young kind of like country person loving playing music, I actually was planning on going to Melbourne to study chemical engineering, actually, and uh, took a year off, had a gap year and um, ended up being on, uh, ended up doing the gap year and coming back down here and uh, then uh, swapped completely and got into the Victorian College of the Arts to study music. Wow. <laughs> study music. Yeah. And that was where I met those guys in Cranky. Yeah, right. I mean, um, and that was just... That scene at that time, yeah. like the, the mid-90s in Melbourne, you know, we had... Um, the, the band scene was amazing. We had dire Directions in Groove, you know, Cranky, Tism, um, the Steinbecks, the Lucksmiths, Supergroove touring from New Zealand and various other... Like, the scene in Melbourne was electric back then. It must have been a pretty cool thing to be part of too. It was, yeah. And I count myself very lucky and I've only just been reminiscing so that clip and a few other things have popped up recently on social media and on the World Wide Web and stuff. And we've been reminiscing about that time in Melbourne and how special a time it was and how integral it was to the development of like Fitzroy and the culture of Melbourne. And just to have been so lucky to have been, you know, you get born into things, you know, you, 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 you are at a time at a certain 
just through luck and circumstance and to have been there was, yeah, it, it does now in hindsight seem very, well, I seem very fortunate. And So yeah. I'm just going to bring you forwards a few years. Um, I've got this other clip now, something quite a bit more recent. I'm going to try not to talk over this because it's so sublime at the beginning here. It's just gorgeous. I hear a baby crying in the night Whispers in the wind So, of course, this is Kutcher Edwards, the great Kutcher Edwards. Um, how did the winemaker from Gippsland end up working with Kutcher Edwards on a record like this? Yeah, well, it, it, it is kind of pretty much, I've dabbled in music over since I got into winemaking. Wine, music took a very big backward step um, when I moved to the Yarra Valley and started winemaking there. And just recently, actually mostly through ISO and just prior to ISO, I started to get a lot more back into music. And it just so happened that um, one of the guys that I've been playing music with down here is a guy called Andy Stewart, who's got a studio up in the hills of Woolamai where um Goitier's really famous record was was produced and um and recorded um you know somebody that i used to know and those types of tracks and uh and he won a grammy up there and anyway i got to know andy and we've been playing music together and well, i was just telling the story earlier today about kutcher kutcher moved to phillip island um maybe about 10 so years ago um i've known him for quite a long time through another um friend of mine who you know we were talking about like worlds and how they collide he was my old manager at allen's when i worked wow. at allen's prior to me in the industry yeah and then so um kutch and i met through him and then i pitched this idea to kutch about doing an album with andy and me and local south gippsland musicians as a sort of almost like an album of place in some ways you know like let's just use we've got this group of musicians that we we play really well together we really like working with each other and how about do you want to come on the journey with us? And he said, I'd love to. And it just sort of has blossomed from there. And We Sing, this track has been the first single off what is going to be an album to be released sometime I, next year. I just so. I really recommend that everybody um, just jumps on YouTube and search up Kutcher Edwards' We Sing because um, if you can survive that song without tears on rolling down your face, it's pretty extraordinary, isn't it, Marcus? It's just like it, everything he does comes from such a – like a – a soulful sense of place and you know and yet he's got that great crooner vibe as well and uh and it was uh, like that was a great day i think when you posted that on social media and i went that that has just made my that's made my week that's pretty cool yeah it's really reinvigorated my passion for music and um i feel very humble to to now you know, i sort of underestimated at the time when we pitched the idea to him about doing something together now I feel incredibly humbled to be a part of it um, and to be to be doing it and 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 yeah bringing back hopefully what I can bring to the record and what we're doing together. It's 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 been an amazing journey from so many already and it has it's only really just begun with Kutcher and with his album and hearing his stories of the stolen generation and his past and and obviously then just his ability as a musician. It's it's just amazing and um, yeah that track was. But, yeah, we're pretty lucky to be a part of it. Some of the who's who of Australian music ended up getting involved. In a, yeah, it's just a collaboration, you know. And it was an ISO choir. Yeah, so it's <laughs> uh, crazy. We really recorded all of their stuff in their homes and stuff, and then sent it in, and we pieced it all together, and Andy mixed it all. Yeah. I don't know how. Yeah. Had like a hundred different tracks or something. It was crazy, wow. but yeah, amazing. Yeah. yeah, well, very cool. Look, um, I, I guess we should, you know, push towards wine a little bit because, um, and I've got these <laughs> wines burning a hole in my bench here. Um, and um, don't don't forget, folks, that uh, uh, this is actually a, a live stream. And unless you're watching it back on um, the Instagram TV, please feel free to ask your questions or comments. Um, we love we love to hear from you during these things. Um, so yeah, uh, hit us up with uh, especially hit Marcus up with questions about wine, life in Gippsland, music, all those things. So every week I promise myself, Marcus, that I won't ask the obvious question about where did the name come from. Um, but then every every week somebody comes at me from regional Victoria with a great business name. Uh, Dirty Three, immediately when I heard it, uh, calls to mind like um, either a Sergio um, Berlusconi spaghetti western from the 60s <laughs> and, and you're all there in a cantina <laughs> drinking tequila, uh, smoking fat cigars or, um, you know, Maybe um, a, a band from Melbourne. Is it a, a Melbourne band? With the same name. <laughs> Where does it come from, mate? No, it actually was very much. We pinched the name from the band, um, 
And so we can't lay claim to having been, you know, a, a sort of clever enough to come up with the they're, name. They're cool with that. Um, but funnily enough, yeah, they were. So we, we actually asked them at the start. So originally this, this business, is it's now mine and Lisa's. We run mm. it on our own. Um, but it, it started out with a good friend, um, Cam McKenzie at mm. Four Pillars and Stu Gregor, who's also mm. at Four Pillars. We, we sort of were the dirty three, if you like. But it was always going to be a story about... Um, it was always going to be a story about the exploration of Pinot Noir in South Gippsland, and ideally, we'd have you know three different vineyards that we could we could work with and ex- sort of showcase Pinot Noir and the the unique differences that you get mm. and subtle differences that you get between different sites and single vineyards. And so, yeah, gradually, it's fortunately we've found those three vineyards, and now that's become very much the story of the three dirts. But we did actually ask them in the, in the, at the start if we could use their name, and they gave it to us for wow, their blessing. Cool. So, yeah, <laughs> which is really great. Well, look, I've got these wines here on the bench. Um, I, uh, Australia Post didn't quite get me the wines that you sent, but my local bottle load, um, you know, he's loyal. So I've got I've got the dirt one, the dirt two, and uh, the all the dirts. Uh, where do you reckon I should start, mate? I reckon we start yeah. with all the dirt. So I reckon, yeah, off the track. So let's, uh, no let's start there. So um, <laughs> I have to warn you, I am uh, more of a drinker than I am a wine writer. So you know, um, I, I will be guided by you about, yeah, about what to expect with this. But I do know how to swirl a glass. How's that? So um, yeah, tell me about Very tell me about the three dirts. Yeah, so the the three different dirts. Well, this is this. Um, this one, all the dirt, is a blend of um, basically those three vineyards that we have. Plus, we've also managed in the last couple of years to um, find another couple of Pinot Noir vineyards that we're really excited about to yeah. put into this blend. So we really want this wine particularly to be, you know, sort of really express what we think South Gippsland Pinot Noir is, the idea of terroir, the notion of terroir or the notion of, you know, um, wine expressing a certain place. And um, we think this does it really well. It's all the dirts. It's, um, as I say, it's a blend of all of the vineyards, um, but it's still got that yeah. lovely perfume and, and rich. Like there's a real richness to sort of South Gippsland Pinot Noir that you often don't find in Pinots from other parts of Australia, particularly. Um, certainly Tasmania, you would see it to a degree and, and more and, and, and certainly over the ditch in New Zealand. So, um, you know, we're getting much more cooler climate than where you are up in the Yarra or, um, you know, Geelong or Mornington. We're just that bit colder and the wines have this real sort of depth and, and complexity that's, I think, quite unique to, to Australian I, mainland. I have to admit that I um, went to refresh myself on South Gippsland Pinot Noir and this was the bottle I opened. Um, and uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm not a wine guy in that, uh, you know, I don't have obviously your expertise. However... Um, immediately to me, there was all this um, this mid weight that that I really kind of enjoyed. This sort of meatiness um, that you know, whereas the pinots I'm used to around here are more sort of tight and and a bit more floral. Um, this this yep. is um, this has got some weight in the middle, and is that what I'm tasting from Gippsland? Is that uh, you completely nailed it? I couldn't have expressed it better myself. So I think very much if you were to sort of look at the differences between say pinot from the Yarra 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 pinot is more about perfume. Mm. Um, and fineness, you know, and real sort of, um, you know, sort of they have they get a completely different palate structure to what we get in South Gippsland. So definitely, you find that more richness, more mid palate flavour and mid palate weight. And um, so you know, it's sort of I guess in a lot of ways it'll it'll stand up to sort of aging a little bit better in some ways, and also um, stand up to a, some other range of foods that might be a little bit more heavier and and richer in in flavour than than some other peanuts. Yeah. So. Um, it often has this sort of slightly meaty, earthy character, which I really love about what we get in our wines. So um, I'll just, yeah, to tell you, we, we're going to taste the other two wines, but the three vineyards that we work with, the three yeah. vineyards pretty much around the dress circle of Lee and Gatha. Yeah. Um, so we've got one vineyard, Dirt One, which we call, so there's three single vineyards, a Dirt One, Dirt should Two, Dirt a, Three. Should I give that a crack while you're talking about Dirt One? Sure, Absolutely. So I'll talk about the three different vineyards. So Dirt, Dirt One is a vineyard just outside, um, called Berries Creek Vineyard, just out the other side of Lane Gatha. Oh, the colours so different um, about, to, that, to that first Pinot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Anyway, um, yeah, sorry. So yeah. Uh, we, we're actually seeing some no, vision right. of that um, as you talk there, so oh, that okay. people can actually sort of associate. Is that beautiful drone footage oh, and right. obviously some fruit from um, a vintage recently? 
So, yeah, the dirt one is this lovely north-facing vineyard up in Berries Creek, which is on the way to Murphy North. Um, and funnily enough, speaking music, it's directly across the road from a place called Mossvale Park, okay. which for me holds one of the greatest music festivals in yeah. the country. Um, the Summer of Soul, they call it, over there, which is the Live Bird Arts Council. Um, and actually, Dirty Three has actually played at Mossvale Park. <laughs> <laughs> so, it all comes together for you, doesn't it? all comes together, mate. I happened to be working in the winery uh, making the first ever Dirty Three in 2012 and Dirty Three were – and at that stage, I don't – no, we hadn't named the brand at that stage and Dirty Three were actually playing across the road and I could hear them. <laughs> ah, that's great. <laughs> so, that had funny. to be. Yeah, so that, that, there's a winery right next door called Belvan and our early incarnations of our wine. Okay. There, but it's a lovely north-facing site. It's on this really deep red volcanic soil. Um, which is very famous for the around this part of um, Gippsland. It, there's, it's obviously we're in right in the heart of dairy country. Um, the, you know, a lot of rainfall, quite cold and wet, and quite miserable sometimes. But that actually lends itself really beautifully for thing garden. Um, and yeah, this is a, as I say again, north facing side on a ridge line overlooking the Tarwin Valley, mm. um, Tarwin River Flats. And yeah, it's it's quite a fertile site, so it's it, it can take a lot of work and um, manipulation in the vineyard to keep it under control because it wants to go crackers. So, um, but it, it makes these really lovely kind of, in comparison to the other two, slightly more delicate, and it is getting a little bit more. To, uh, towards something you might even find in the Yarra Valley, but it's a little bit more delicate and red fruited and perfumed, mm. but it still has some beautiful structure and power as well too. So, so I'm um, lucky enough to have the 17 here. Um, yes. Uh, yes. By all accounts, you a are. bit of a cracker. <laughs> <laughs> but then on the, so it's got this really uh, like, um, it's quite different smelling to that first wine. What's that first thing yep. that, that I'm hit with? It's almost, well, certainly with you, what you've got, the age difference is going to make a little bit of a, a quite a significant difference. But but um, the 2017 vintage was a much cooler vintage yeah. than 19. 19 was a warmer vintage. So the wines from 17 were more delicate and fine mm. and more perfumed and aromatic. And the wines from 19 have a little bit more power and richness and fullness. Mm. Um, but this, this site, no matter what the year is, it always has this sort of lovely red fruited kind of character to it. And we always add a little bit of whole bunch into that, um, into that wine as well too. We just found that it really like works really well and helps to express that wine a lot. So that's a, when we put all of the bunches together um, without the stems taken away. So they all just go into the just ferment and we use about pretty much they, as they come off the vine, as they go in. It's exactly that. So that, then they get picked and the next day, 75% of it gets put through what we call a destemmer, so it takes the grapes away from the stems. And then the other 25% we put into the into the vat as as whole bunches or mm. with the stems and everything. And what that does is give a, a perfume and an aromatic complexity to the wine and really helps to lift the wine out of the glass a little bit more. Mm. So um, we find that if this site, if we don't do that, it can get a little bit sort of one-dimensional. Okay. So we're just trying to make complexity to it. Yeah. Wow. It's a technique that you'll find um, a lot in the Yarra Valley. So there's very few wineries now in the Yarra Valley that aren't, aren't using some form of whole bunch to bring some more perfume and complexity to their wine. So we probably rely on it a lot less than the Yarra um, and Mornington, but, yeah, we do use it in certain years and certain vineyards. So, you know, you, speaking of the Yarra, you, you know, you um, had some fairly significant winemaking adventures here before you moved to Gippsland. Um, if I remember correctly, you, you had a, na a label with um, Rob Hall who went on to uh, went on to Mount Mary and do some... And, um, and and uh, does his own stuff under Rob Hall Wine. That Harriet's label of his is going well. But you know, um, uh, uh, Paul Bridgman, who went on to do nothing or Levantine Hill. You know, <laughs> come on. And and you know, of course, he was at Debort's before then and Yarra Yering and um, and Caroline, who who um, now head winemaker at Zonzo Estate and has her own label, um, Bird on a Wire. And I mean, you would it just seemed to have been a golden period for winemakers in the Yarra in that sort of late 90s, early 2000s. Look what you've all gone and done. I think, yeah, there's two in my two chosen careers. I've lucked, I just lucked in. And I think in the wine industry, I was equally fortunate to have just met some fantastic peers and mentors. And you've mentioned a few of them, there's you know, other people like Tommy Belford yeah. and 
uh, you know, Trav Bush and, you know, the other guys that are working, that are uh, Steve Flamsteed, mm. um, you know, Dave Bicknell, you know, I mean, that sort of list goes on of some just wonderful people that I've been fortunate to sort of been dumped in with, Adrian Ryder, who's now up in Beechworth. Mm. Um, you know, I got sort of dumped in with these people and just we bounced things off. The, the industry went through an incredible kind of boom in the, in the mid to late 90s. Um, it attracted a whole lot of people to it and the people that resonated the most strongly with it stuck with it and we were just fortunate to just, you know, as I say, met, meet these people and bounce ideas with, off with them and start businesses with them. And, you know, um, Cam McKenzie was a classic yeah, example of that. Yeah. It, I met him in 98 at Yarra Ridge when I first started there. We did our first vintage together. Right. And um, he, venturing off into sales and marketing, he decided winemaking wasn't for him, but we've remained great friends. And, I mean, look where Cam's that is now. So, you know, it's... it's <laughs> amazing yeah. i'm so proud of um you know and and what they've done but um it, it was just really an amazing time in the yarra valley people like rob dolan who are my mentors and dominic porte who i worked with when i was in the yarra as well too and i just can't i i can't thank those guys enough for what they did and how they opened their knowledge and wineries up to me and all of my peers you it know seemed, it very- seemed like there was um from an outsider's point of view there was like you had there were some there are some big names in wine in the era right and, and it's you know it's a decent sized region in terms of it's just raw crush size or whatever you know the amount of fruit that it processes every year but names like Debortley and um, Chandon and you know the, some of the big international players are here but they they there yeah. seems to be this great culture of letting the the assistant winemakers and the and and the and the head winemakers even have their, their side projects and to grow to grow as as winemakers in their own right. And it seemed to be like this fantastic culture of people, um, you know, working for the company and also doing their own thing and and growing as as um, winemaking professionals. Yeah, I think the only other place that I've seen probably be as um, sort of open and helpful and and um, collegiate as the Yarra is the Hunter Valley. Mm. I just went up there to do the Len Evans tutorial back in 2011 and um, and I was blown away at, at their level of sort of like, you know, camaraderie and it was – they're just – Hunter is probably the, the pinnacle of that but I reckon it's closely followed by the Yarra. I think the Yarra is just amazing – in the way it develops um, young mm. talent and its its idea of just sort of mentoring people through and retaining talent as much as they can, but then also being happy to see it sort of blossom if it if if they those that person needs to move on or you know it's a, it is a wonderful place and I feel very as I say I feel very blessed to have to have learnt my trade in the Yarra. I spent eight years in the Yarra before I moved back home. Um, going that full circle as I was saying before was I couldn't wait to get out of here and always said that I never wanted to come back and then funnily enough you know once we had kids you had twins and as you know and 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 the calling of home was just very strong I know for whatever reason people don't really understand it but um, I didn't really have a job to come back to I had to sort of create a job and um, and then yeah different things like dirty three ended up blossoming out of it so yeah I feel very yeah it's 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 a good it's a good good to be back it's, home it's, it's it come to, to a, a good sort of full circle hey yeah uh, speaking of um of uh, south gippsland let's let's uh let's open the other one i got here which is the two the number two yeah so this is a little vineyard um it is little it was it was bigger once but a little bit of it got pulled out um there's only about two acres left uh, this is the vineyard that was uh, in the. It's in the heart of Lean Gatha, um, right in the right on the edge of the township. It's on very similar soil to um, dirt number one, red red rich volcanic soil, but it's um, faces east as opposed to north. It was originally owned by a company called Caledonia Australis, who still do exist, but they um, went through a change of ownership and sold off some assets. And this is one of the vineyards that they sold off, and um, it was a really fantastic. Um, a, a lovely guy called Barry Hill bought the property and then he's now subsequently leasing it to us. So, um, and yes, yeah, so it's a really beautiful site and it makes it quite a different style of wine that, to the first one you probably different. see. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it, really the main difference with that wine is just the aspect. So, you know, the first one faces north, this one faces east, so it picks up all of the morning sun and much less of the afternoon sun. Yeah. And what that tends to 
this cools the site down a little bit and the acidity is the really pronounced thing in that yeah, line. Totally. So um, I, I, I'm some, guessing some whole bunch in that as well, that kind of like store. You know what? There's actually none. Really? So that's Do you know what? I reckon amazing. I got caught out on that at your cellar door when I visited about 18 months ago. Um, and I said that I can, I taste like um, a kind of a stalky character in there is that whole bunch. It's not. There you go. Exactly. And, and it's really amazing where this is the amazing thing about site and winemaking and what happens and some places don't need it. That place doesn't need it. It's, it's got, if, if it has whole bunch for me, it, then becomes more about that whole bunch character mm. than it does about the wine. It's already got that lift that you that. were talking about in the first one and it doesn't need it. Yeah. doesn't need it it's naturally. So this is the kind of, I guess, the, the skill and the learnt things that we learn with working with a vineyard over time. If we trial things and we, we, we need to react to seasons and, you know, so sometimes... Um, you know, sometimes some of these vineyards will have more whole bunch than others in given the year or, you know, so if it's warmer, we use more. If it's colder, we use less. So it, it's a, it, it, it's, um, and that could, the only way you can do that is through experimentation, through failures and yeah, wins yeah. and, and, and time, you know, like it's once a year, you get a go and <laughs> it's your grand you final, isn't it? Final, your grand final every, you know, and it is, it's very much like that. It's like the pressure's on yeah. and, um, I'm convinced that's three quarters of the reason that we're actually winemakers. We just love that adrenaline rush and that kind of intensity that happens for that period of time. And there's something really wonderful and invigorating about it and terrifying all at the same time, you know. So when I have it is like the great thought of that. It's really that's a great analogy. When, like when, I've, when I've had the, the great fortune to have been asked to write, write um, you know, way out of my comfort zone about wine on, on the odd occasion, um, I've often suggested that people um, do exactly what we've done here and I know I've done this at your cellar door as well just line a few a few wines up line up the you know do do the the, the tasting where you where you pour the different wines and, and taste the different thing and, and 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 you in your own mind you move away from ordering a glass of Pinot Noir to being a little bit more educated and um, selective about the particular wines that you drink and, and, and an understanding of why they are the way they are. Which brings me to a question about South Gippsland. Um, as a wine region, it's really small. And if you look it up as a region, it doesn't appear. So what's the, what's the story with South Gippsland as a wine region? Yeah, it's, good. it's, a, good, it's a really good question because um, South Gippsland doesn't, doesn't have a recognised what we call a geographical indicator in the industry, so it's not recognised as a um, Yarra Valley or anything like that, or you know Barossa Valley. Gippsland is recognised as a as a region. That's vast, We've, though. But, like, but, I mean, you, you've got you go way up to kind of, kind of you know um, Lakes Entrance, and <laughs> yeah, no, we'll go, no further. further. So oh, it no. goes to it's yeah. So it's it's a third of the state. So it goes from. Um, uh, Malakuta to basically yeah, the, right. the backside of the so you know basically this you know Pakenham and around that area so it's enormous it's a third of the state and it's called a region um, so it doesn't make any mm. sense as a region really but the problem is is that in order to get recognised as a region you need to produce a certain amount of tons and none of our if you like what you might call sub regions which could easily be classified as East Gippsland. South Gippsland and perhaps West Gippsland and maybe Central, something like that. None of those regions in their own right make enough tons to be actually be a region in their own right. So it so it's caught in this sort of rock and a hard place, I guess. Yeah. You know, um, between I, I guess for me, South Gippsland's my home. It's also where I make wine, and it makes sense to me. East Gippsland's as foreign a country as what the Yarra Valley yeah. is. You know, to me now. They, in fact, the Yarra Valley is probably closer to me in my heart than than what oh, East Gippsland right. is about. And in any way, as as I, because I've wonderful friends and wonderful winemaking friends in East Gippsland, and there's amazing people, and, and everyone should go and visit <laughs> there. And really, and um, and it's true, but it's just it just is like another country to me. It's like another how, place. How does that um, play out in what like, you see with like, the way people understand Gippsland wines, though, and and you know, the the way that we're going to. Be yeah, there's no doubt about that. We've got a big challenge. I've sort of just become more comfortable in it. I, 
I have for a long time struggled with the way we do it. I went, no, we need to promote this as Gippsland like we do Tasmania, mm -hmm. and uh, and I and 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 there is some a lot of merit to that, um, and we could do that. It is a long road. It's a long road. It's a long game. You can't look at these things of promoting a region in, in you know, that it's going to happen in 24 hours or a year or, you know, it's going to be a long, long time before people understand what it is about a region. Look, from my point of view, I'm more about now just like if anyone's talking about Gippsland, that's a yeah, good right. thing. So um, hopefully we can get people here, then we can ed do the education on, um, on you know what it means to be in South Gippsland or East Gippsland, or you know what our little patch of dirt means, yeah. and what it what it what it does, and what it does well, and and um, you know, and I think with time, I think that story will evolve, and the idea of separating out sub regions in some capacity, even if it's not from a wine capacity, will happen. Um, but just at the moment, it's it's more. I, I just do that, I guess, myself, and to just say identify that we're from this part of the world i think winemakers yeah. do that better than most people because you have an innate understanding of the importance of place because you taste it in the glass right so uh, and i think yeah. um the importance of where you are is as much about what you produce as who you are in that place so it's kind of a uh, yeah an interesting yeah. thing it is really like I, you're right about that and i guess that whole idea of um there hasn't really been anyone else in South Gippsland that, or in Gippsland that's explored multi multi sites, you know, and mm. and like like say places like Oak Ridge. If you want to take examples from the Yarra, mm. Oak Ridge and um, Giant Steps and um, De Bortleys and places like that are really sort of like been at the fore of that idea of exploring single sites. And we've been lucky enough to be able to find vineyards in South Gippsland because there's not that many. So yeah. <laughs> we, every time one's come up for lease or be able to purchase and prove it gone. Yes, as long as it meets our criteria. Does it looks like a grape. Yes, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a little bit yeah. like that, but we are fortunate. Like, not only is do we are we lucky to have the three vineyards, but they're three really fantastic vineyards too. They're not just ones that we did um, just say yes to anything. It mm. was it was important that they they did fit with our whole notion of really creating great wine. You know, we don't yeah. want just want to mediocre wine we want to create great wine and um and 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 have that because you can't do it with mediocre grapes you can't have that narrative about talking about the nuances of site if you just overcrop it or yeah. you know or just or don't pay it respect i guess it's something yeah. i've heard in the last few weeks over and over actually is is that you can't make great wine from bad fruit and um and no great vineyard ever had a bad view <laughs> <laughs> from what yeah, i well, from what i've seen a, it's a there's pretty an old, spectacular there's an old, there's no term actually for recordings is that you can't polish a turd mate so. yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah well um look regional and roll do they say so uh, regional victorians have really led the way on this whole covid um roadmap and and you've you know, you guys are, are um, in a position that we, as Melburnians in the metro fringe out here in the Yarra Valley, are um, a bit envious of at the moment. What's the what's been the story for you guys during COVID? Um, yeah, it's it's been a tough road. Mm. Um, we're feeling a bit again. We're feeling a bit blessed at the moment that we are going to be some of the first regions to or the places to come out of this, yep. and hopefully, hopefully, none of us go back in. Um, yeah, look, it's been a very tough road. I'm not going to pretend that the last six months have been easy. We've been really buoyed by, um, you know, our, our wine club members have been amazing. Um, you know, they've really helped support us. A lot of the bottle shops have been fantastic. And every one of our sort of suppliers and people who have been able to help us have done that. Um, but certainly the fact that, you know, basically hospitality in Melbourne and pretty much everywhere like dining has stopped and means that our sales have obviously plummeted um, and also people visiting here um, that stopped as well too. So, you know, I think maybe around 60% of our business now has been through this place, through yeah. Cellador, which has only been open for three years. So it's an amazing kind of turnaround where we're so stoked with what's happened, but it's it's been a massive hit to not have that, um, that income. So, we're we're optimistic though. We're still feeling really buoyed that um, 
you know, there's there's been a lot of interest already, even mm-hmm. even without Melbournians being able to get out of the place. We've still had, we've had lots of interest and lots of people um, express their want to come and see us and visit us. So we're going to open up in a couple of weeks. And I think you said second um, of October was the date you're going to reopen. And what's that going to yeah, look like exactly. for you? Yeah, well, we we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. It's going to be we we've we've we we've. we've, we've it is going to look different, um, and I think in some ways that might be a good thing. Um, so we, we need we need to go to things like table service. Um, so we're not going to be the the tastings at the at the bar are going to be a thing of the past, and and that may be forever. I and mean, we, we we don't know. These are things that are changes that could actually be quite positive because we'll, we'll move to more things like what we're doing here, where we'll have the a flight yeah. of wines, yeah. or some people might call it a paddle. You know, a lot of a lot of breweries and distilleries have gone that yeah. way. Um, we were offering that as an experience, but it was sort of people were still more tending towards the stand at the bar and, mm. you know, do the old traditional tasting. Um, but now we're going to be forced into this way. I like this. We're, this we're, is, for me, this is yeah. such a better experience, you know. Yeah, and that's right. And this, and this is one of the things about now us thinking about, well, what does this place mean now? So we, we had a certain thing going in this place and it was more of a casual turn up, you know, sit down, have a drink, listen to a bit of music and blah, blah, blah. And that's sort of, you know, we'll, we'll be able to hold on to some of that, but some of it's going to have to change. And I think maybe in some ways it might be for the better. So maybe the atmosphere will be maybe not quite as pumpy and we might, we're not going to be able to get as many people through, certainly for the short term. And um, But certainly the idea of focusing on wine and really actually talking about wine and talking to people and giving people a real experience, I think, could be a real win. Yeah, yeah. You know? And, and um, um, it gives you the chance to to work on those areas of your business and work out what works for you and the people that are coming in. Yeah, very much so. And look, we've, you know, like things like bookings. I mean, we've never, mm. we've never done that before. Uh, we've never taken a booking ever unless it's for a private function. And, um, and we've, if anyone rings up, we say, no, we don't take bookings. And now we're, we're going to be the opposite. So we're going to be fully booked. So if you haven't got a booking, you pretty much can't come. So, um, I think it's going to be interesting. I'm just kind of excited about what it looks like. We'll learn. We'll, I'm sure we'll make some mistakes. I'm sure we'll change stuff as we go. Um, but but we're sort of excited about what it is and what it looks like and, and what we might be able to offer as a new experience. So Yeah, yeah. It is, it's going to be an interesting time for the whole industry, no, no doubt. Um, so um, you're open, opening on October the 2nd. Your regular hours, yep. uh, people need to book through the website or by phone or? Yeah, we're, we're looking at a, we're just setting that up right as we speak. So we'll be going with a full online um, booking system. Yep. Uh, we will be able to take orders, uh, sorry, bookings over the phone, but we're encouraging people more to do it online because we're going to need emails and all those kinds mm. of things. So, um, but yeah, booking online. And then obviously um, uh, we're going to be, we're going to open just Monday to Sunday. For a period just and see how that goes and then most likely almost certainly will be seven days a week over the summer so if people got time off and looking for a yeah. break somewhere please come down so so um obviously you know um at the moment you're talking to other regional victorians right so so metro melbourne and melbourneites can't make their way out to you um fingers crossed it's looking good but you know uh um yeah. at the moment you're talking to other regional cities and and that that's who you're trying to attract out to you know it's kind of a weird vibe isn't it it's like a weird space to be in you're dragging people from geelong or you know yeah it, it, it is it's you know it's a weird time for everyone but it's interesting it's it's you know, i walked down the beach here yesterday and there was quite a few people here so mm-hmm. um some of them like quite a few of them were local yeah. but because it was a wonderful for the beach but there you can see that there's people from outside the area they're perhaps coming from Trelgan and you know places yeah. like that anecdotally that's what yeah. bring around the place that a lot of people are just getting out of just you know just not even that far down the road yeah. just to be able to come away you know so yeah I think it's going to be a really interesting time for us all you know in the and and I hopefully hopefully regional Victoria has a really big win over the next you know 12 months because um we we all need it. <laughs> yeah, oh for sure. Look, um, hey, while we've been sitting here, a few questions have come in. Uh, most mostly they're just people, uh, old mates, you're saying good day, uh, which is kind of, oh. <laughs> there's Michael Kennedy saying those were the days. Um, yeah, good day, <laughs> yeah, Michael. That's right. And uh, people um, loved your musical history, and uh, <laughs> but people are saying we are just so sick of being locked down. Uh, I know it. I know it. But you know, it's. <laughs> 
not not long now, people just hold on. So, um, look, Marcus, I want to say thanks for um, for actually taking some time out of your Monday afternoon to sit down and just chew the fat with me. It's been it's been a great pleasure to hook up and talk again. And these wines are stonking, mate. There's there's something here for everybody um, in terms of price point and in terms of like you know what what people like in, in a Pinot Noir. So you know, and congratulations on on an extraordinary sort of winemaking career to this point and the business you have now. Oh, thanks, mate. It's been a real pleasure to catch up with you again, and, and uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for asking me yeah, on. No worries. So um, thanks, uh, beautiful OHO people. I hope you've enjoyed another little insight into what's going on uh, with a passionate producer outside the Metro Ring. Make sure you like this video and follow our Insta and Facebook pages for more updates from One Hour Out. If there's someone you think that we should know about or feature here on Outcast, please drop us a line either in the contact link in our bio or just leave a comment below. We'd love to hear from you. And see you next time with another passionate producer on Outcast.